Damn these Biloxi blues It happens every night Every night And I ain't never met a riverboat dealer That could ever be a friend of mine I have So he never treats me kind It leaves trouble on my mind So I'm bidding farewell Putting in my notice And I'll see you at another time Bang. This highway Does not know my name And I don't care Nope I don't care Heading my way For another place And I got Three good tires And a spare Just a white line gypsy Getting out of Mississippi With just enough gas To keep there Low Budget Live, not so live, from the Low Budget Live Bar and Grill here in beautiful southern middle Tennessee. Happy Monday to all you low lifers out there. This is the podcast for Monday, August the 29th, and we fixing to be right into Labor Day and staring into September and staring into the seasons changing a little bit, get, getting a tree stand very soon. I actually... Uh, I'm recording a couple days early because of deer hunting, to be honest, uh, and our guest this week could record today. So uh, spent this morning in a tree stand for the first time in 2022 here. We've got a velvet hunt in Tennessee. It's way too dang hot to be in a deer stand, but I, I had a good good time sitting around watching some deer, saw some uh Saw some foxes, saw all kind of stuff this morning. So uh, I got a, I got a deer that I'm, I'm 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 very obsessed with, and I know I don't talk about hunting just a ton on the show, but I, I get one that gets in my crawl every now and then. And uh, of course, I hunt every year. My boys have gotten really into it in the last couple of years, and I have talked about that on here. But I've got one hanging around, and he's real. He's sporadic. He's not consistent enough, but. Was hoping to maybe uh, get a get a shot at him in velvet. He didn't show this morning. But we got a couple more opportunities, and then we got to wait a month. So, uh, got that going. Hunting season back in. Let's see. Do we have a hunting? Uh, you know, I, I think this this works. We don't have we, we don't have the budget for a lot more sound effects, so we kind of work with the three or four that we have. But I think. Hunting season. Da, da, da. I think that works. I think that works. But I uh, spent some time in a tree, and that's always for me, man. Slipping in there like forty-five minutes before daylight, an hour before daylight, sitting there in the dark, watching the world come to life. Man, it's. Uh, I don't know. It, it's not for everybody, but man, I love it. I love it so much. So uh, glad that that is back around, and uh, and and hopefully this weather's going to cool off a little bit sooner than later. It is definitely. Uh, where we start seeing a shift, them days getting shorter, and uh, and the seasons start changing. So, uh, welcome, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. I'm I'm rambling as as usual. So, if you saw on my, I, I have to address this. I have to address this because there's been a lot of concern, and you can see, look right here. You can look at my neck. I made a post this week that trocar hooks are very sharp, and they are. But I gotta say. The picture <laughs> looked a lot worse than it was. I did take a treble. I, I, I got. I, I was uh, at a pond. I have not put the express in the water yet. Still, shame on me. But before dark, I was uh, at a pond. Got snagged with a little uh, a little whopper plopper action and whoosh, popped it. And I may or may not have took it right here. I got very lucky. Okay, I got very lucky. A little, uh, just a little, just a little, just the tip. All right, we didn't get a barb, but when I got back in the truck, I had to send the triple threat a picture because there was blood everywhere. It, it was bad. It bled for like two hours. Stupid, stupid. You ever cut yourself shaving on your neck? You realize there's way more blood. There's there's a lot going on there in that region. So I looked like somebody had slipped my, my throat for a couple of hours, man. It was bad. It was <laughs> all down in my chest. And then last night, getting out of the shower, nicked it again with a towel. <laughs> Just bled everywhere again. So thank you for your concern. I made that post. I thought it was funny. So many people had some great comments, but, uh, but that's what happened. 
that's what happened. It was uh, it was interesting. So we move on. We move on. We learn, and we we are grateful that I didn't go into an ear or an eye or a jugular. So uh, very thankful for that. Also thankful for the sponsors that make this very show right here possible. And I could not do it without each and every one of them. Starting with Startron, the folks at Startron, Starbright, who are now my brethren even more now that they are owned by the same folks that own TH Breen. I, I got to spend some time in some meetings this week with the one and only Gregor Dornow from Startron, Starbright, and Eric Applegate, two of my dudes there, and I uh, had a great time spending time with them, putting some plans together for the future, like some TH Marine, Startron Synergy, they call it, in the corporate business world. I'm not really corporate, y'all know that, but uh, not all about that corporate life either. But synergy, synergy, but got a lot going on. They are uh, they are a wildly successful company, and it's cool, you know. Even this week, learning more and more, I feel like I, I feel like I know the story of Startron and how it happened. But uh, we got to spend some time with Gregor telling even more and more about it this week. It's very cool. So. Start trying kicking ethanol in the teeth, bringing you LBL for five years now. You want to put that in your chainsaw, put that in your weed eater. Enzyme, enzyme enzyme-powered fuel treatment that's going to take care of ethanol and get it out of your hair. That is what it's all about right there. A little dab will do you. It's available basically freaking everywhere. We appreciate the folks from Startron supporting LBL. Pro Guide Batteries. My favorite batteries that I've ever had in the old bass boat, and that is uh, that is by a long shot because you know why I haven't had any issues. That's how I judge things. You you can tell me this is good or that's good or this is bad and that's bad, but I base my you know my my opinions off of my experiences, and I can tell you. Almost two years into running Pro Guides, I've had zero issues, and I absolutely I love the new lithiums. Love that thirty one. AGM trolling battery. So you trolling motor, excuse me, not trolling motor, cranking battery. Uh, I think I lost too much blood. Let's just be honest. But you can get your own Pro Guides at ProGuideBatteries.com. Use code LBL10 to let them know you're a low lifer. They got chargers on there. They got all kind of stuff. Get on there, check it out. Tell them we sent you LBL10 Pro Guide batteries. Baitworks.com. Baitworks.com. Not only, not only a fine fine retailer of all kinds of tackle from mega bass down to berkeley flatworms but they have now added they made a significant add on th marine items so they're getting into that marine side they're going to be adding electronics lots of things coming from Baitworks. but get on there you can use code duncan-10 they have got a large selection of th marine items on their accessories for your boat and they have them in stock which is i'm going to be honest a little hard to find these days. So check it out, baitworks.com. Not only for baits, they've got a lot of things going on up there in Springfield, Missouri, and I am proud to partner with them and be involved in all the insanity that is baitworks.com right now. Duncan-10, bait-works.com. Go check it out. Last but not least, the boat that is just longingly staring at me every single time I walk into my shop, and it's like, hey, man, hey, man, You've not put me in the water one time. You should be ashamed. I've been sitting here for 10 days now with no attention. You've done nothing. That's right, the Express Boat X21 Pro LE. Going to be making a video on it soon because, and it's probably going to be a video in the garage because I can never find five minutes to put the stupid thing in the water. It's killing me. It's killing me. I want to run around with that, that new show check it all out i'm gonna get it out uh I, I gotta get it out this week got to got to got to but express boats the official boat of low budget live and the all things traveling circus that x21 pro with the sea deck hopefully very soon i'm gonna have the garments on there i've already got the power poles and the garmin force trolling motor of course but uh, still gotta do a little bit of rigging add a few uh a few little nitpicky items and then we're gonna be full bore but i i had a good friend of mine reach out to me this week he's like so how's the new boat i'm like bye ah, it it's, it's taking up space in the garage right now. It's ridiculous. But they are that Bass Master Classic winning bad boy. Express Boats, Hot Springs, Arkansas, building excitement since 1966. All right. I'm really excited about today for a lot of reasons. Uh, the guest we're going to have here in a minute 
is someone that I have uh, I've kept up with, I've fished against, been around a good bit, and 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 man, it, it's just he's he's gonna be a legend. That's the only way you can put it. He is uh, he's climbing the ranks, he's winning. He he's some of his stats are staggering, and we're gonna get to that in just a minute. But first. First, we're going to talk. We got that Bassmaster Elite Series going on right now. It actually just kicked off today, and uh, and and so things aren't really taking shape just yet. But Brandon Pollinick catching them today. Brandon Lester catching them as well. Of course, I think Lester's like thirty-eight points behind, so he needs he needs Pollock, Pollinick to have another slip up like he did at Oahe. I don't think you're going to see that there from Brandon. He's going to close the door on the AOI and. Um, and, and both of those dudes have just had incredible, incredible, incredible years. David Mullins, Chris Johnson, they're all having great years. If you can be that consistent, that schedule's been – it's a lot like the MPFL schedule this year in that they've just been everywhere from A to Z, north to south, and, and even out to South Dakota. It's crazy, man. So I think if you can hold that consistency – and I was listening this morning, and Zona said, you know, Lester has not missed a cut all year. All year. Polonic missed one. Polonic missed one, but I think he's had more top tens, obviously, and uh, Lester with the win there this year. It's uh, it's it's to me from having done it, and and even I don't care what level you fish. If you're your local level, you're you're fishing BFLs, you're fishing Toyotas, Opens, whatever. You have to respect that kind of consistency because it is so damn hard, man. It is so hard. An angler of the year will always be to me. The hardest thing to win. Championships are great. Bassmaster Classics are great, obviously. But man, those AOIs are just gosh, like Swindle having two. That's just incredible to me. So incredible. So uh, you know, it's going to be uh, interesting. Hopefully, we can we can chat it up with some of those guys next week. That was another reason, kind of. You know, uh, I want to I want to talk some Bassmaster. I want to talk Oahe and, and lacrosse, but they had to go back to back, so didn't have that opportunity this week. But we will uh, we'll get back get back with some of them Bassmaster boys next week. Jay Shakur, the, the rookie of the year race, pretty much got that thing locked up, unless he just has a uh, monumental uh, disaster up there at lacrosse. And I just don't see that happening. He's from that general area, so as he said here on this fine program so uh cool bassmaster season i just i hate even though it's almost september i just hate that we don't go further you got bpt wraps it up in like two weeks bassmaster's done pro circuit's done mpfl we still got two events and it just i just hate that we don't go further i i understand the argument as to why we don't fish october november december in the sport but man there's some uh, some really cool techniques that take place then yeah it gets grimy yeah it gets tough but but man i miss those fall tournaments like the old school bassmaster used to uh used to do they used to start in like sept- the season actually started like september october and went all the way through it's pretty uh that was truly an angler of the year uh more so than than what we have now but uh, it's always sad when it's over, but hey, we'll have a lot of fun podcasts. Guys will be getting ready for deer season. They won't be doing anything. We're going to film some boats and pros. So uh, there are there are pluses to the negatives that it's winding down. Speaking of NPFL, we kick off September 1st through the 3rd. So this coming week, Sandusky Bay is stop number five of the league. We will start our coverage on September 2nd. The Big big Cat and I in studio there are going to be up in Wisconsin. We actually won't be on site like we have been all year. We've been up there in, in good old Appleton, Wisconsin, our second home. Uh, Sandusky Bay, man, Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, it's all in play. They're going to let the guys run wherever in the heck they want to go, weather permitting, of course. Uh, you never know with those Great Lakes. That's always a variable. So big water, big small mouth, big risk. You know, when that FLW Super Tournament was there that Justin Lucas won, there were lots of guys that trashed bass boats. I mean, trashed them, trashed them, trashed them, trashed them. So it's going to be interesting to see. We've got a great Angler of the Year race it, between two dudes, three dudes right now. It's pretty tight. But uh, Timmy Reams, West Virginia Angler, going to try to get him on the show here pretty soon. He is uh, – I covered him so much last year. He's just just super quiet dude, very unassuming, and just catches him. Catches him, man. We we had him on camera so many times last year. We, we Fat Cat and I were talking about it. We go back and look. It's incredible. 
how many times he was on camera last year and great human being, but he has called him all year, headed into event five. And Gary Atkins, winner of our last stop there at Saginaw Bay, is in second. Gary, a great lake, smallmouth guy, wins the last one with smallmouth. So this one is certainly a fastball right down the middle. The variable being, you know, will the guys be able to get out on the big water with wind? You know, all those scenarios. Can you get out there? Can you get back? No breakdowns. Like, there are so many things that play in an angler of the year race, just as I talked, if you can catch them. I mean, we started at Lake Cumberland with terrible weather, a one-day shootout. Then we go to Hartwell Sight Fish craziness tournament. Watts Bar was grimy, a little bit offshore, a little bit of shallow. Then Saginaw was just a slug fest all the way around. Everybody's stacking them up. And now we go to Sandusky. Great smallmouth fishing, big water, could be big runs. You know, it takes, uh, I believe, a couple of hours to get over to St. Clair. Certainly a risk, but if you can get over there, and I've talked to some guys that are like, I'm going. I'm going to St. Clair come come hell or high water. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a fun one to watch. I'd appreciate it if you tuned in. Join the Big Cat and I for our broadcast Friday and Saturday of next week. Help us bring in your Labor Day weekend. You know, we we want we want to show you some smallmouth bass, probably some largemouth. Sandusky Bay is not a it's a it's it's a sleeper largemouth fishery as well. So, how will it shake out? You know, obviously, I'm going to go with smallmouth, and I think it's going to take some weight. Just talking to some people, doing some research, the fishery is in really really good shape right now. So, uh, be interesting to see how it all shakes out. And can Timmy Reams take that AOI lead into the final tournament down at Toho, which is what we've seen him really excel at, grass fishing, flipping, chatterbaiting, top water. That's what he likes. That's really what Timmy excels at. And it'll be down there uh, first week of November. Last week of October, first week of November, we're going to decide all of it, see who takes home that AOI, the Progressive Angler of the Year. We're going to see who who wins that final shield of the year. So somebody's going to take home 50K. And I just ask, if you've never given us a shot, if you've never watched MPFL Live, try it this week. Try it. We have a good time, man. We've got a lot of really great anglers, great personalities, and you can you can learn something for sure from watching. And I know many of you that tune in watching. I, I'm, I appreciate each and every one of you. But, yeah, I'll kick things off. I believe it'll be uh, 8 a.m., 8 a.m. Friday morning. Quick pause. Going to text our guest. Tell him we are almost ready. If you're just listening to this, this is the sound of me typing. If you're watching, you know what I'm doing. So our guest today, I'll give him a, I'll give him a, a little, little bit of a plug here. And and if you are one that doesn't pay attention to major league fishing, if you are one that doesn't pay attention to the pro circuit as much as you should be because it's one of the most competitive trails in fishing. This young man is truly, truly one of the best anglers to pick up a rod and reel that we've seen in the last 20 years. And rightfully so. He's the son of a legend. Ron Sheffield is his papa. And Ron's obviously a bass fishing millionaire, but Spencer Sheffield just won the FLW, uh, MLFLW title championship up there on that St. Lawrence River, 200 grand richer. But the coolest thing, I was looking at his stats and (laughs) blew my mind, dude. Now, granted, he just added 200 grand, but take that aside and think about what I'm about to say. This young man is over 900 $1,000, (laughs) $900,000, I'm going to say that, hang on a second, hang on a second, pay attention, pay attention, bring it in, $900,000 in career earnings, okay, he fished in the, in the early 2000s a lot, and then after 2015 took a hiatus from pro fishing, came back in 2020, and he has finished in the Angler of the Year race. He has finished since 2020. He has been second, 
29th and third. He just qualified for the Bass Pro Tour, so he's going to be shaking it up with those boys next year, and I'm sure giving them a dang hard old time. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to try to get him on the phone right now. Arkansas's Spencer Sheffield. Hello. Is this Stetson Blaylock's twin brother? <laughs> Not his twin brother. But, uh, <laughs> he's considered his brother. Over there. <laughs> How are you, brother? Welcome to Low Budget Live, dude. I was just, I was just rambling about your stats, and Spencer. I'll be honest, dude. I, I have, I've kept up with you. I've known of you over the years. I've, I've known your dad. I've known a lot of them Arkansas boys, but your stats. And I know you're a humble dude, but your stats are mind blowing, mind blowing, dude. You're you realize you're almost at, at a million bucks just with MLF, right? Yeah, but I mean, you got to factor in that's BFLs, that's Toyota Series, that's co angler. I think I had 175 of that was just from when I was a co angler. Again, though, <laughs> you want it, brother, with a rod and reel. That's all that matters. That is yeah, that's that is true. A, I was, there. There aren't I was a lot of people. <laughs> I was I was getting my hair cut earlier, and I, uh, there was a high school kid in there, and that's what he was just talking about. He's like, man, it's so awesome. You know, it's what you do and stuff. He's like, I want to do it so bad. You know, he was asking, he's like, what do you do for work when you're not fishing? And I told him, I said, dude, so I took a bunch of extra classes when I was in high school, and I went on, when everybody went on Christmas break, I was done. And I said, I have not ever made a dollar doing anything but catching a bass since 2007. So, He's like, whoa, no I didn't kidding. know you could really make a living just fishing. I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, there's several guys, you know, probably 200 of us. That's all we do. That That's amazing, man. And you are absolutely ate up with it. It doesn't matter if you're fishing the title championship or fishing at home. You are fishing all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I am. I, I like fishing these little local tournaments here around the house just as much because of the uh, – I mean, I compete just as hard for 200 bucks as I would 200000 you know. It's just about the win, I guess. Them W's, they, they go a long ways, whether they're for 200 bucks or 200000 mentally. just keeps you going. No doubt about it. And you guys, the, the, the state that you're, you're from, that area, I mean, there's some, there's some fish catchers <laughs> from that part oh, yeah. of the world. Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of studs around here, no doubt. I mean, there's, there's a lot of great fishermen that will never do it for a living that could absolutely – do it you know what i mean so no doubt about it and and i think that that's that's something that a lot of people get caught up in you know i think that there's so so much of a spotlight obviously even you know it's what i do on the shows talk about pro fishing all the time and and we can't lose sight of the fact that there are some guys that just don't want to do it or can't do it for one life reason or another you know and and uh, and the stars kind of line up for some some folks to get to do it, and and man, you're making the most of of a of a very young career because you 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 kind of stepped aside in what 2015 you you took a little hiatus and then yep. came back in 2020. Yeah, I went through a divorce and uh, had to file a bankruptcy and everything, and in the course of the divorce. Had almost seventy thousand dollars in credit card debt wrapped mm. up on me. That's how I paid my entry fees, and mm. uh, you know I was just living from tournament to tournament. You know, back then, no sponsor help at all, not even a dollar. Wow! And uh, so it was very hard to do it. And when that happened, my credit credit was completely full, and I had no way to pay. I had to quit, you know. And so I just fished locally there for four years and made my way back slowly but surely. So you were able to to get get that monkey off your back, get that that credit back up, and and start all over in 2020. And man, when you came back second in the AOI the first year, did you expect that? No, I'm not going to say no. Uh, I knew when I came back, I was going to be a lot better and a lot stronger uh, in my fishing, just mentality part of it. Okay, I had so many mistakes that i had made when i had previously fished on the water so many mental mistakes i made so many mechanical mistakes i had made that in that four years just staying here i learned all of the mistakes i made i learned how to fix them i mean you're still going to make a lot of mistakes on the water especially mentally but mechanically the right hooks for each presentation the right line 
I mean, and there's different hooks for different guys. I mean, right. some guys use different type rods, so they're different, different. Some of them are parabolic, some of them are, you know, I mean, there's different, but I found what worked for me. And uh, that was the biggest thing. And then I really got consistent here around home. I mean, where I was winning five out of 10 tournaments, winning Angler of the Year in every trail. And that's when I realized, I think you finally got it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Finally found exactly what works for you because so many times, even here locally before when I was fishing professionally, I was, I felt like I was always that guy that came to the way in finishing third, fourth, fifth. And I'm like, gosh, I jumped off a six and a five today. I should have won this thing by five pounds. Well, you know, I was always losing that fish that kept me from winning. And about two or three years into that four years I took off, I was no longer that guy. I was the guy that was winning by two to five pounds i mean i figured out when i if i got the opportunity it seemed like i always capitalized on the opportunity you know i was capitalizing on almost every opportunity the fish gave me and it was just by fixing my mistakes i learned how to fix my mistakes and when i come back out on tour i was coming back out with a lot of confidence yes i'm fishing against a against a different totally different group of guys different skill levels they're all really good Lake said I don't fish all the time, but I knew that I still was going to get my opportunities. And when I did, I could capitalize on them on Sam Rayburn or or Lake Okeechobee, just like I was on Hamilton or Washita. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so that that's what made such a big difference for me. What was there talking about those mistakes? Was there one mistake that you found that you consistently made? Like when you really broke it down from from. 2015 and and you know uh it backwards right when you you take that break and you're fishing at home was there one thing that you mind sharing with us that that you don't mind sharing with us that was just like oh my gosh this was yeah, something was, that really hurt me a lot on the water definitely it was letting it de besides the hooks and the line and all that it was letting it develop on the water in a day's time <laughs> uh before when I was out there on tour fishing, I would pull up my first spot. If I didn't catch them like I thought I should, I would run to my next spot. If I didn't catch them like I thought I should, it immediately kicked in. Oh, oh crap. We mm -hmm. might be in trouble. Something's mm -hmm. changed or something. And I would just start running around from waypoint to waypoint to waypoint, running strictly practice. And it would never end up developing. I mean, yeah, I still had great years out there even before. I mean, I think I finished 12th in the points one yeah. year, 18th oh, yeah. one year, but there was a lot of, uh, I would have that two or three tournaments a year where I'd have an 80th or a couple hundreds or something like that. And it's just because I strictly wasn't letting it develop on the water. Uh, now it's one of them deals where I rarely ever go to my best spot first unless I think there might be somebody else there. Hmm. It's one of them deals where I try to save my best for the last or until I absolutely have to have it. Uh, I strictly continue to practice during the tournament nowadays. Like I get on a pattern per se, like, okay, they're biting uh, a crankbait on this type of bank or, or uh, drop shot out on these type of points, or I'm scoping them out over this type of stuff. And instead of going to the places where I found them in practice and I know I can catch them, I continue to expand and grow on that pattern on new places and I've learned that you can you catch them just as good in practice or you catch them just as good in the tournament as you did in practice if you continue to practice but using the same things that you learned from practice during the yeah. tournament just on new places. And then when you start running out of places in, pra or in the tournament to practice, then by day three, day four, when you really need the places you already know they're at, that's when you can start going back to places you know that's got them and they're fresh fish because they haven't been fished for in two to four days. And uh, that has been the biggest thing that I've learned uh, for me that works. I mean, I know a lot of guys, they immediately run to their best waypoint right off the bat, yeah, right yeah. off the gate, first thing in the morning. And I've just never been that guy. I wait until I absolutely have to have it. Hmm. That, that is, man, that is, that's interesting because, yeah, as you're telling that, so many of us, if you get a juice juice hole <laughs> and you yeah. you get a bunch of bites, you're like I got I got to beat man Spencer's gonna be there Michael Neal's gonna be there I got I got to get yeah. there you know but <laughs> I, I love that so much because you hear guys like a Brandon Paulnick who super consistent you know over the last several years 
in particular say stuff like that that man you just gotta you gotta fish the moment you gotta let each day kind of dictate your move and i think that what separates a guy like you who who's just on this incredible run having a great career and and uh and a guy that maybe wants to do it and has trouble qualifying is i think so many folks when they leave that they leave that uh single day tournament world and they go to multi-day tournaments they do get caught up into that one spot or two spots and what you're saying man you're you're saving fish you go into day one going i'm gonna be here day three and possibly day four i'm not gonna i'm not gonna mess this up yeah i, I mean, love I'm that in i'm in every tournament to win and i mean you know in reality that's not gonna happen i mean heck i've been doing yeah. 14 years this is my first win but i fish as every tournament i'm gonna be in the top 10 in that final day but uh, it's just huge for me to be able to continue to practice during the tournament and continue to get bit because every guy says it. It, it seems like everybody, you know, well, well, I caught 20 pounds every day in practice, and they <laughs> roll up tournament day, and they've got 12. That's you know, right. I don't know what happened to them. Well, it's because you are you caught them in practice, you know, yeah. and I feel like if that guy had just continued to do what he was doing in practice, he would have probably caught 20 pounds again on the first day of the tournament, the second day of the tournament. And so I just started noticing that. I just got sick of always seeming like every swing of the bat in practice, it was a three to six pounder or just quality fish. And then in a tournament, you go right back to them places and they're small or you're not even getting bit. And it's just like, you know, especially now with live scope, you see that the fish are still there. They just don't bite like they did in practice mm-hmm. because they you educated them. Yeah. So I feel like that three to five day break is huge. And uh, of course, you know, now having live scope, a lot of us are a lot smarter. We actually know what's there now. So you can see that, hey, there's eight or 10 fish there. They all look like quality fish. I don't need to catch more than one. And there's no sense in throwing in there and shaking one off because I see there's more there. That's right. So you roll up on a spot, you catch one, you see there's several more there. I'm pulling the trail motor up and I'm going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so it's just one of them deals where I try to save the guarantees for as long as I can because there's a, so many times out there on the water, you're struggling, you need that, that one more three or four pound bite. And, uh, you know, if you just go practice during the tournament, you're usually going to catch you two or three good ones in the course of a day. And then I can filter in one of my good places to go catch two more good ones. You just said something really interesting about live scope. And I'm obviously a, a, a live scope nut. I love it. It's fun. I'm, I'm nowhere near as dialed as you. And heck, I don't, I don't know that there are many people as dialed as you at this point with it. But you said something interesting. You don't want to educate them because – you see the I, I, the haters, as we like to call them, but people on, on online that are forward-facing sonars ruining it, and it's just so easy. Take that away from these pros, and let's see what they can really do, blah, blah, blah. We see it all the time, but you just said something. Even even with it, they got a bite, A, and B, you can roll through them kind of quick. Even with that magical device, we can see them. It doesn't necessarily mean that Spencer's going to roll up with 26 pounds every day, does it? No, not at all. I mean, <laughs> I've had it for two years now, and I've only weighed in 25 once with it, and that was at Gunnersville this year where you're supposed to weigh in 25. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, gosh, man, if I could go – if it, if live scope was that easy, I promise you I would have 30 pounds every single day I come to weigh in because it's just like down at Rayburn this year. I think the first day I weighed in 15 or 16. The next day I go out and weigh in almost 17. Uh and then the last day, I ended up finishing fourth. You know, we zeroed out and had mm-hmm. 14 and a half, 15 pounds. Dude, if I'd caught the best five I was seeing every day, I mean, I was seeing some legit 10 pluses on live scope. I never even got one of them to buy. Not a one of them. I mean, I had one place, there was a brush pile that you could throw a jerk bait out there. And I'm telling you, there was only like four on this pile, but all of them were like, they had to have been double digits. They would come up wow. to my jerk bait, just giant. <laughs> Look like big old carp. And they would wow. come up to it and just kind of get within six to eight inches of it and follow that thing all the way, boat never bite. And I spent so much time, not so much time every day, but I'd pull up there every day and give them suckers, you know, 15 you got to, to yeah. Bite. And they, they weren't going to bite. I mean, it didn't matter what you threw at them. You could throw a big swim bait out there, big jerk bait. I mean, they, they would follow it to the end of the world, but they were never going to touch That's it. That's crazy. And uh, it's just amazing to me to see – the caliber of fish that are in some of these lakes that even with a live scope and you can see them watch their body language watch how they react to our baits you still cannot get them to buy 
And, uh, it, it, you know, it's just, it's crazy. If anything, it hurts more having it because typically <laughs> back in the day, I would have pulled up on that brush pile, made three or four casts out there, not got a bite. I pulled up the trailer and I would have left mm -hmm. and maybe potentially caught a 10 pounder off another spot in the course of a day. Cause I would have just saved myself 20 minutes. Uh, but nowadays, I mean, we can see what's down there and I try not to spend too much time. I, I've learned that if the fish act negatively towards it one time, then it's done. <laughs> you're basically going to pull up. You're going to catch one of your first or second cast. And then the rest of them, it don't matter if there's a hundred of them there. Once one fish negatively reacts to your bait, the whole school is not probably, wow. none of them are going to buy. So you just have to keep running and gunning and going and going. The only time I really put the trumbo down and just go is when I'm just straight up hunting them. I just get out over, you know, 30 to hundred foot of water and I just take off going from fish to fish to fish. Then it's different because they don't have a clue what's going on around them that I just caught a three pounder 20 yards back. They don't yeah. know. You know, so you can continue to catch those fish. But schools of fish, man, they're tough. It's tough to catch more than two out of them. It really is. Unless you're on the Tennessee River where they're very current-oriented and they continue to buy. Yeah, and they just reload and they you get them to fire once and, and sometimes mm -hmm. they'll just keep going. But how often yep. do you just target solo fish? Without getting into your uh, getting into your secret playbook too much, but how, how often do you roam around like that and, and target just those singles? It's mainly in the winter time is when you can really do that right before the spawn when the big females start to isolate themselves and get higher up in the water column to to warm those eggs and mm -hmm. get them ready to go to the bank to lay them. That's when it really works well to just go hunt what I call hunting them down. Mm -hmm. That's when, that's what I did at Rayburn last year. I literally put the troll motor down and I just took off over these big expansive flats, big humps, whatever. And I might go 20 minutes in between fish, but I would have finally see one out there, you know, a three plus pounder and you could fire a bait out there too and get her to bite it. But, uh, I, that's my favorite way to use it. I mean, uh, just up there with my wind last week. Yeah. I was in an area I was fishing some spots that had multiple fish on it, but every day I weighed in using my biggest fish was a solo fish, mm. and I had the troll motor on 100, and I just took off, and I'd look left, right, left, right, you know, every 20 foot or so, and I finally see a big smallmouth out there just sitting up off the bottom three or four foot out over 30, you know, 30, 35 foot of water, and I'd be able to throw a drop shot to her and get her to go to it and eat it. Those are the easiest ones to catch, just mm. the big groups of fish that are the hardest those are the ones that are so hard. It's just like, I guess they're a lot like a big ball of shed. You watch shed, they all move together. Mm -hmm. Every one of them, if one goes left, the entire ball goes left. And I feel like bass are the exact same way. The first cast, they'll all go to it with the intentions of eating it. And if you had 20 baits on, a, on your line, you'd probably come back with 15 plus bass. But after that one box, you throw back in there, they might all run to it, but the first one to it doesn't eat it. So none of the others eat it. Wow. It's very cool to watch. And uh, they're just the toughest to catch is when they're schooled up, in my opinion. It's the singles that are the easy ones to pick off. That's all. That, Ladies and gentlemen listening right there, that's good stuff right there. You better be taking notes. This man this man is, is dropping some knowledge on Low Budget Live. Uh, so I, obviously you had great success as a co-angler. Angler of the Year standings on the coast side. You were the top ten every year that you fished, and and you were traveling with your dad some then. And a, a lot of bass fans out there know Ron and and his bass millionaire career. Just I mean, dude, one of my favorite favorite tournaments ever was old, the old Hickory Mega Bucks. Your dad won when I was a kid. When I was in my bass fishing, just fandom on TNN, uh, watching it all the time. Your dad winning up there and uh, was just one of my favorite tournaments ever. But what is, uh, what is it like having that legacy to follow now? And so it's kind of a two-part question. And what does Ron think right now of, of your big title win and how things are going for you? Well, it's kind of intimidating. It's not, a, I'm not going to say intimidating, but it's, it's one of them deals where growing up with a dad that did it full time, obviously started my passion for it. I mean, I was fishing with him before I could even remember. I mean, I, I can remember going out with him. Just my first memories were on the boat with him reeling in ones that he had on, on a black spinnerbait at night. <laughs> 
12 o'clock at midnight and he'd say all right son get up here and get this one in and it'd be a seemed like an eight pounder probably was only a three and a half but you know when you're two and three years old everything seems like a jump but yeah uh it was just you know i can remember throwing a 10 inch worm on a zepco and and we'd be fishing you know a monday or a tuesday night tournament and uh just uh growing out there with him i remember i always wanted to throw his rods and reels and he wouldn't let me because they were bait casting oh, you can't <laughs> throw these, you're too you're too small and i remember the first time he told me that it it fired me up because i remember we got home that same day and uh that he had just told me i couldn't use his bait caster and he was inside drinking a mountain dew probably eating dinner or something i'd already finished and i remember going out there and grabbing one of his rods and going out in the yard and i was determined to learn how to throw a bait caster. I remember I started real slow, but I knew if I got a backlash, I didn't know how to get a backlash. You're going to be in trouble. So yeah. <laughs> if I got a backlash, I was going to be, I was probably going to get a whip. Big Ron and was coming outside with the bill. <laughs> yeah. But I can remember, man, within like 10 minutes, I was bombing that sucker across the yard. I just started real slow. And, and I remember going in and get my dad so excited. And I said, dad, come here, watch. And I remember he walked out the door and I grabbed one of his rods. He's like, what are you doing with that rod? You better put it back up. <laughs> and I took that sucker and I fired it out there. And it's like his jaw just dropped. And he and from that day on, I never threw another Zepco again. That's cool. But I've always wanted to get out from under his umbrella. I feel like everybody always, the legendary fishing family or Ron Sheffield's yeah, yeah. son. You know, I'm sure Scott Martin felt like that a lot. Yeah, uh, a lot of guys. Too, yeah. At the beginning of his career. And I feel like, you have to do something, accomplish something. I always, I never don't want to be associated with my dad's career, yeah, but course. I want to have my own career and we fish completely different. I mean, growing up as a kid, all I knew was throwing a, a three quarter ounce or a one ounce Stanley black and blue jig with a <laughs> sapphire blue super chunk on the back of it or a Jean LaRue crawl out on deep grass. And I mean, it was miserable really because <laughs> on a good day, I might catch four bass. Yeah, they'd all be big ones. But it was just, I, he had already introduced me to numbers of bots at a young age. We would go to places. He, he roomed with a guy out there on Bassmaster named Fred Bland. We called him Taco. Taco. He, yeah. All, all he threw was a shaky head. He invented he, it. He's the man. Yes. Yeah. Yep. He, he, he basically invented a shaky head. So I'd been invent, I had been introduced to that. And dad had took me to some lakes out west in Arkansas that was nothing but rocks and bluffs and we would go and throw a shake head. You know, these fish had never seen a shake head. And we'd have so many hunter fish days catching them. And uh, I had already been introduced to catching lots of fish. And, I mean, I was obsessed with getting a bite. That was what it was all about, getting a bite. And uh, so when I got to make those trips with Dad, it made me want more of that. Mm -hmm. And the spinning tackle side of it was so fun. Uh, and that's what grew – to me, wanting to catch them on spinning tackle all the time. I just love catching them on a spinning rod. I tell people every day I'd really catch 30 pounds of bass on a spinning rod as I would a casting rod and 65-pound braid. I mean, sure, I love breaking their necks with a frog or punching just as much as the next guy, and I go places all the time just to do that, but I still love catching them on spinning me rod. Me too, but man. To get this win, I feel like I finally have stepped out of his shadow to a sense maybe only one foot but i'm finally halfway That's out cool. of it and can start growing a career as my own legacy not just under my dad yeah and uh it means a lot to him because he never did he should have you know he's told me a hundred stories of how he should have won this classic and that class should have won four or five one of the classics. new orleans had, classics i remember he should have won yep. yep logan martin he literally had a four and a half pounder on a spinnerbait They'd come up there the side of the boat just laying on its side, and all he had to do is get down in the lipper, but he went to boat flopper, and his spinnerbait wire broke, mm. and he watched the winning fish swim off. Dion Hibben, I think, won it dead late yep. going into that last day. He only yep. lost by like a pound, and he had a four-and-a-half-pounder right there at the side of the boat. All he had to do is get down there and just grab her, and he didn't. You know, He just went to flipper, and it broke. His spinnerbait wire broke and lost him the classic. But mm. So to win a championship in the Sheffield name, family, uh, means a lot to me not only to me but to him especially that hey one of us won a championship that's awesome you know so it, it's it is big and he, he he's very you know happy about it and proud and, and uh, just excited for me my my 
my favorite thing about what you're saying there with getting out from under his his shadow, and I know exactly what you mean. To me, growing up, Ron was a spinner baiter, flipper. You know what I mean? He was like the jig mm-hmm. fisherman. Like he'd pick apart a dock like nobody had ever seen, dude. I remember reading Bassmaster magazine articles of Ron Sheffield picking apart docks and 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 flipping a tube and and flipping a jig and stuff like that. And so I think it's so cool to see your offshore ability. And I know he's obviously a great offshore fisherman as well, but uh, gr- growing up where you guys live out there, but man, so cool to see you get your wins and and build this career that you are with electronics and offshore. I think that's awesome. I have to ask you this though: Does your is your dad a live scope fan, or does or is he too busy on the golf course all the time to even look at the screen anymore? Because <laughs> I know he's a golfer. Dad, it, it, he's obsessed with live scope as I am. Okay, that's cool. I mean, he he does. My dad has not owned a boat since the day he quit. No kidding. He only gets to go. He only gets to go fishing with me now when I go, and uh, my brother doesn't own a boat either anymore. He actually works for my brother now. They building houses, and he stays okay. busy with him. My brother's just so busy. My brother's an excellent fisherman too. I'm telling you, he he's ever been as good as I've ever been. He just doesn't do it. You know, he builds houses. He loves building houses. He owns his own business, building houses. Stays so busy wow. doing it, and that's his passion. But uh, so my dad only gets to go with me when I go. We go probably 15 times a year together, uh, mainly crappie fishing. He just thinks it's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's obsessed with it. He, uh, you know, he, he just, he, he eats it up. He just, he wishes he had that technology when he was out there. How can you but imagine? Yeah. He'll, he'll be the first to tell you. And it, it's aggravating to me when you hear guys say, the guys back 20 years ago were more talented than the guys now because my dad would be the first to tell you that that is so far from the truth. It's, it's, uh, it'll make you mad almost. Yeah, People I get tell, it. Has said it to him that, well, if it wasn't for live scope, he wouldn't be able to catch them. Mm. He couldn't catch them like you could. And my dad said, I was so one dimensional 20 years ago. If it wasn't a jig or a spinner bait, I wasn't going to catch them. These guys nowadays, everybody's got that technology that's out there doing it for mm-hmm. a living. Yeah. Everybody is so well-versed in finesse fishing, power fishing. Uh, it doesn't matter. Those guys are going to catch them. They've got everything to, to do it with nowadays that we didn't have back then, you know? And he, he just talks about all the time that like, man, if, if we'd had this technology back in the day, I would have had to fish completely different. Yep. And I don't know if I could have done it. You know, like that. He said it was a miracle to us guys 25 years ago that we could just get good with one technique and stick with that technique and beat other guys uh, that was throwing a jig and a spinnerbait as well. But he says now everybody's good with everything, you know. So true. And uh, I had to learn just like he did, man. I mean, when I was growing up until, you know, basically live scope come out or waypoints come out. I grew up using a flasher or yep. using a Carolina rig and a big yes. weight to feel what was down there on bottom. I remember we would take a, we always had a jigging spinner, three quarter ounce jigging spinner rigged up and we would drop it straight under the boat and count the seconds it took it to get to the bottom. So we knew how deep we were out off that point. We would keep scooting up till we got to the depth we wanted. Then we'd pick up a Carolina rig and throw it to see what the bottom felt like. Mm-hmm. And then when we felt what we wanted and got bit doing what we wanted or how we wanted, we would make a landmark up on the bank with two trees or a buoy and a tree or, yep. or a buoy and a building. That's how I learned to fish. So to me, yeah. I don't care if they took live scope away or not. I know how to fish from back in them days because that's how I was taught. Yeah. And so I'll just live scope is no different than a cell phone, man. It just makes my job easier. I don't have to go from door to door knocking now, asking for business. I can just pick up a cell phone and call, but I still have to do the exact same job as I had to do before. It just it's a little simpler for me to be able to to get my job done quicker and more effectively and efficiently. That's that is well said right there, brother. I mean, well said. And obviously, everything's going to change, right? Like it, it changes constantly. Everything in life with technology, and as we advance in society, uh, and there are a lot of folks that that don't like it, and, and that's fine. But I think that uh, it's it's not magic necessarily. But I think that uh, it has changed the sport. It has changed the way we fish. And and when you're, you're talking about your dad saying he was one dimensional, you think back to guys like Denny Brower too right yep. just jig jig fishermen or you think about the sight fishermen that were just dominant back in those days the overall fields like you're saying they're so much more versatile now 
head to toe, 160 guys on pro circuit, whatever, whatever it is. They're all, they've all got every bit of the same electronics you do. They've all got power poles. They've all got spot lock controller motors or anchor lock controller motors. All got great mapping. You have to be versatile now to compete yep. and to be consistent like you are. And, uh, and dude, one thing about it, you are, uh, you are doing it to it, Spencer Sheffield. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to share those stories with us and, and spend some time here on low budget, man. I, I've been wanting to have you on for a long time and, when you won that deal up there, I was like, I, I got to get Spencer on here. This is this is the the moment to uh, to do it. So I can't thank you enough, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It was, it was a good time. I, absolutely, man. And, and tell your dad we said hello as well. And dude, best of luck to you on that Bass Pro Tour next year. I know you're. Uh, I know yeah. you're fired up. I cannot wait to get on Bass Pro Tour, man. I just, uh, gosh, that's so my style and. Uh, Oh no! I'm looking for big things out there next year for sure. No doubt about it. Now, let me ask you this: before we go, will you fish both? Will you will you double dip Pro Circuit and Bass Pro Tour? Or is this one of those things where, for you, you just are going to want to focus on the Bass Pro Tour alone and and try to make sure you make Red Crest and make as much money as you can there? What what's your thought process? No man, I if it I would John Cox it on steroids if I could. I'd fish ten ten tours a year if I could. I wish I was fishing a tournament every week of the year except thanksgiving and christmas because i just love to compete i love being on the water i fish an average of 300 days a year now as it is uh i love seeing new bodies of water it's just i love pulling up to a place and seeing how quick it's going to take me to catch a bass and start to break that body of water down um and for me it's a way of life i can't support and feed my family without fishing tournaments and uh it's been hard uh thus far only fishing seven tournaments a year so now i'm really looking forward to being able to fish that 15 to 20 plus tournaments a year it's gonna i feel like financially kind of free me up a little bit to really fish my heart and soul out not that i don't already but to really really go for stuff now not not necessarily maybe kind of tend to lay up to get that 10 grand check so i can for sure get to the next one it's uh yeah, man, it, it, it's it's great. I, I wish that there was four or five other tours I could fish out there as well, and they wouldn't overlap because I promise you my name would be on the leaderboard. It might be dead last and it might be first, but it would be there, I, I can I, assure you. Well, well, hey, I got to say this, and there may be some anglers at the MPFL to get mad with this run you're on right now, but, hey, you come on over there next year if it don't overlap, son. <laughs> Come on, hey, they I, fishing I'm for they fishing it. for big cash, buddy. Come on, I know. I I sent the email out last year trying to get on, but never got a response. So what? Maybe this year, All yeah, right, hang on, hang year. on. We gotta, I gotta, uh, I gotta play this sound effect right here. Come on, Brad Fuller. Come on, Spencer <laughs> Sheffield wants in. All right, we'll yeah. we'll make that happen, buddy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd like to get over there because there ain't too many tournaments, in my opinion, that a guy can fish as long as the schedules don't overlap uh you can count me in i'll pay my money up front and let's get after it i love it man i love that mentality well spencer it's great talking to you and best of luck going forward brother yes sir thank you thank so you much. man spencer shuffield that was awesome y'all that so, sometimes there, there have been several conversations that have taken place with me in this bar and grill here that that do truly blow my mind and and I, I realize how fortunate I am to be able to have, and that was one of them right there. So he dropped a lot of uh, a lot of really good information about live scope and just about his mentality. But I, I think if there's one one thing we can say going forward about Spencer Sheffield is that he's born to be a bass pro. There's no doubt about that, and and such a such a humble dude, and and really. He's gone through it, man. He's gone through it. He's, his life's like most of our lives in that, you know, it's it's been a roller coaster. He's really got things going the right direction, and he's catching them, and, uh, and I, I just can't thank him enough for coming on. Can't thank you guys enough for tuning in each and every week here to Low Budget Live. Of course, all interviews brought to you by the W Sauce. Get that, get that America's Worcestershire sauce. Telling you, it's good stuff. Good, good stuff. I'm going through it at a very fast pace around here. We're going to have to get with the crew and get some more sent in. But uh, we appreciate those folks supporting LBL as well. All right, I'm going to take you out with some Biloxi Blues. 
and then uh, and then we're gonna see y'all in MPFL live, and then we'll see y'all back in the bar and grill probably. I think I think next week's show will probably be a Tuesday upload because of Labor Day, most likely. Just just hit me between my eyes, ADD as usual. But uh, I'm pretty sure that will be Tuesday, not Monday, because we will be uh, we'll be celebrating the Labor Day holiday. All right. Hope everybody has a good week, and I will see y'all next time. From Jackson Town to Tupelo, I never could make it last. Spanish moss, a Civil War ghost, well, I'm gonna leave them in the past. Any direction, Lord, I'll be fine, it don't matter, east or west. North, south, wherever the wind blows, I'm leaving those burdens at rest. This highway, it does not know my name, and I don't care, no, I don't care. Heading my way for another place, and I got three good tires and a spare. Just a white line gypsy getting out of Mississippi with just enough gas to get there.